Okay, this is lecture one on the gastrointestinal tract. This will be a general introduction about the major gastrointestinal organs, uh, their functions, um, how to relate the GI tract with the kind of threefold approach to the human being we've taken before. And then uh, we'll look, look a bit at the embryology, the gut wall, and then some of the structures like the nervous system and the circulatory system that are important for GI function. As before, you uh, might want to follow along with a um, uh, kind of standard anatomy and physiology text if a lot of this information is new for you. Um, this information follows pretty closely the arrangement of most of those textbooks. Um, there's also a lot of good information uh, available online, some free physiology textbooks and so forth. Okay, let's look at some of the major gastrointestinal or GIT organs. Um, of course, the alimentary canal is the whole continuous tube, basically from the mouth to the anus. And we classify the organs as either primary or secondary. So, of course, the mouth and the pharynx, the throat, the esophagus, the stomach, uh, all parts of the small intestine. And we'll look at those in detail, the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. And the large intestine are all primary GI organs. And then secondary or accessory organs would be things like the teeth and the tongue, salivary glands, uh, liver, gallbladder, and pancreas. And we'll be discussing all of those. So the major functions, just from a kind of biomedical perspective, and we'll delve into this in more detail here as we go, will be, of course, the ingestion of food, secretion of saliva and digestive juices, mixing and propulsion, uh, mechanical and chemical digestion itself, um, and then absorption of nutrients, defecation, and then, importantly, immune function in this whole notion of food tolerance, which we'll need to talk a lot about. Um, now, of course, the major nutrients absorbed by the GI tract would be our three major foodstuffs, so carbohydrates, uh, amino acids and proteins, and then fatty acids. Uh, in terms of carbohydrates, the majority of them come in uh, through the diet um, as dietary starch. And uh, that process of digestion begins up in the mouth with salivary amylase, but also in the small intestine with pancreatic amylase. Um, and this breaks starch into primarily disaccharides. That's basically two individual monosaccharides stuck together and some monosaccharides. And that would be, of course, glucose, fructose, and galactose would be are the three primary monosaccharides. Um, the disaccharides undergo their final digestion at what's called the brush border, and that's enzymes that are embedded in the inner lining of the small intestine. Um, and uh, that's the cells that line the small intestine. They're called enterocytes. They have enzymes. They're called brush border enzymes, and they will break the monosaccharides down into uh, disaccharides into their uh, uh, monosaccharides. So in the case of lactose, uh, that'll be broken down into glucose and galactose. So those will then be absorbed. Um, and then sucrose will be broken down into glucose and fructose. And there are many different brush border enzymes for lactose, of course, it's lactase. And then for sucrose is sucrase. There's also maltase from maltose uh, and so forth. Uh, amino acids, um, the process of protein breakdown really begins in the stomach uh, with stomach acid and then stomach uh, pepsin. Uh, and that continues primarily in the small intestine. Uh, and the proteins are broken down into dipeptides. So that's two amino acids and then eventually monopeptides. Uh, same thing, there are brush border enzymes that actually help the final process of the uh, dipeptide uh, uh, catabolism. Uh, remember, there are 20 protein-forming amino acids, and those will then be absorbed in the diet. Uh, we'll look at this later, but basically all the nutrients from carbohydrates and amino acids will enter the body via the portal vein. Uh, and the portal vein carries all of this to the liver. So the liver is going to be the first organ exposed to all those nutrients. It's going to process them, take some of them in. It's going to make its own proteins. It's going to store glycogen. It's going to adjust the level of blood sugar uh, in the plasma and so forth. Uh, fatty acids, uh, these again are usually found in nature as either triglycerides or in oils. They're just free fatty acids. And that'll be uh, basically triglyceride is a glycerol, which is a sugar molecule with three fatty acids attached. And remember, the fatty acids can be saturated, meaning they have no double bonds, uh, or unsaturated. And if there's only one double bond, that's a monounsaturated, many that's poly. Uh, cholesterol is also absorbed in the diet. Um, we'll look at the process of fatty acid digestion, but basically it's going to involve the fatty acids being broken off from glycerol. That's going to be under the action of an enzyme called lipase. Uh, 
Uh, there's a little lipase in the saliva, but most of it comes from the pancreas, pancreatic lipase. And the free fatty acids then will be um, surrounded by bile salts. So bile salts will come in and like detergent, they're going to emulsify uh, the fatty acids. They're going to provide a amphipathic layer around it. And basically, this is called a chylomicron. So chylomicron will be in the small intestine, and that's going to be then absorbed across the uh, membrane of the small intestine. And that'll go, uh, depending on the size of the fatty acids, the larger fatty acids, pretty much anything over 12 carbons or so, are gonna go straight into the lymphatic system and get go right into the venous blood and then uh, uh, back to the heart. Uh, versus the smaller fatty acids will actually end up going to the liver first. So we'll look at that in detail, but that's going to be how fatty acids are absorbed. Remember, cholesterol is also a lipid. Um, it's not technically a fatty acid, but it's a lipid. Um, it's also absorbed in the diet, although the majority of our cholesterol actually comes from liver synthesis, not from the diet, which is, I think, a common misconception. Um, vitamins, so these all come in through digestion. So there's water soluble, and that's going to be our B vitamins, and there's many of them, and then our vitamin C, and then our fat soluble vitamins A, D, there's uh, actually eight E's, uh, we call that the E complex. What most people call vitamin D, uh, E, I'm sorry, is uh, uh, D alpha tocopherol, which is one out of those eight vitamin E's. And this can be an issue because a lot of multivitamins, interestingly, only have that one. Uh, vitamin E, uh, and if you take that in excess, uh, you actually end up getting less absorption of the other E's from your diet. So paradoxically, you can actually get a vitamin E insufficiency. We'll talk about that later. And then vitamin K, which is important for clotting, there's actually two of them, K1 and K2. We now think K2 is actually a very important nutrient for bone health. Um, it's in butter and fat and things like that. Um, but it actually is the vitamin that helps to fix calcium into bones. So it's being added to a lot of bone supplements now for osteoporosis and so forth. Um, so those are our main fat soluble vitamins. Um, and those are going to actually need the bile salts as well. So interestingly in gallbladder disorders, um, which involve like gallstones or maybe where the liver doesn't make enough bile, um, enough bile salts, uh, we can start seeing uh, malabsorption of fats as well as the fat soluble vitamins. And that's going to be a big issue with malabsorption syndromes, which happens, for example, in celiac disease. So we'll look at that later. Uh, and then minerals, that's going to be all your minerals, calcium and potassium and sodium and so forth. That's going to come in and then water. Uh, most of our absorption of nutrients will happen in the small intestine. Really what the large intestine does is kind of does a little bit of electrolyte adjustment and then uh, water absorption. So most of this is the small intestine. So that's why inflammatory disorders like Crohn's disease, which affects the small intestine, are going to be much more associated with malabsorption than conditions like ulcerative colitis, which only affects the large intestine. There you can get uh, water and electrolyte loss because of frequent diarrhea but um, people generally don't get malnourished because they're still absorbing through their small intestine. All right, so that's an overview of some of the major functions of the GI tract, which we'll be exploring in more detail. So going way back to some of our introductory lectures on physiology, I talked a bit about this idea that we can really look at the whole uh, physiology as really consisting of three primary processes. Uh, one would be more involving information exchange, and we saw that that's highly connected with the nervous system, um, and that requires the nervous network, that requires receptors, neurotransmitters, that sort of thing. Um, and these information exchange processes are involved in keeping form in the body. So the reason why tissues have certain forms is they're given input uh, from the outside, usually from the nerves, about how to shape themselves. Um, and so that's one end of the physiologic spectrum. Um, at the other end, we have our metabolic processes. And in metabolism, we're not so much dealing with information exchange, but rather dealing with substantive processes. So taking in nutrients, breaking them down through that process of catabolism, and that involves, for example, breaking starch down into monosaccharides, proteins into amino acids. Um, and that is really happening in your metabolic system. Um, and that is really situated, seated down in your digestive organs. So we have a polarity between our digestive organs um, 
and our metabolic system dealing more with substantive world we can say it's closer to the material world and then the information exchange processes that we have more focus in the nervous system sort of concentrated in the head of course we have a nervous system everywhere and we'll see that there's a very important aspect of the nervous system in the gut just like there's metabolism in the head um, so it's not that these are uh, uh, you know physically separated processes but they tend to concentrate in different areas. Uh, we can say the information exchange is more open to the world of thought, the sensory world, ideas, things like that. Um, and uh, then we have in between, we have our organs of rhythm and circulation. So we have our breathing center, our lungs, and then we have our circulatory system. And that's what kind of brings the information back and forth. So for example, the nervous system will secrete different hormones. The hypothalamus and pituitary secrete hormones in very, very tiny amounts. Um, they're actually homeopathic amounts of hormones. And um, we're talking about 10 to the minus 9th dilution, 10 to the minus 12th dilution. Um, and those hormones will then basically talk to all of your metabolic organs and, and turn on your thyroid or your adrenal or whatever it is. Um, and it'll have effects in metabolism. So we can say again, the information uh, non-substantiative processes are secreted into the blood and they go bound, down and communicate into metabolism. Similarly, metabolic processes, of course, are carried up in the blood, for example, glucose and nutrients to the nervous tissue and so forth. So there's a cycling of substance this way. So this whole metabolic system, you can refer to as the metabolic motor system. Motor being that the metabolism provides the basic energy and the nutrients for muscle and for motion. So, um, you know, you can think all you want with your nervous system, but nothing gets done in the world until you actually put your muscles to work, uh, get your limbs to work in a way. Um, so you need that, uh, those substantiative processes in the metabolism and the muscle to actually um, have that kind of activity. Um, and these processes are really concentrated down in your GI system, uh, so your metabolic organs, and that's going to be the focus of this uh, entire block here. Um, metabolic activity, although the initial activity is catabolic, coming in as food comes in, it's broken down from the head, um, the majority of the metabolic activity is more anabolic. It's building up substances, building up nutrition, and so forth for the body. We can think of it kind of having a centrifugal action, sort of providing nutrition and nutrients. We can extend this further and say that even metabolic activities, like for example, in your femur or pelvis of your red blood cell activity, that's all streaming upward as well. And we can ultimately think of that as part of the metabolic system uh, also. But all of that is going to be opposed to the forces we have, for example, coming from the uh, information exchange. And then our rhythmic organs sort of hold the balance. Um, if you look at metabolic cells, like a typical liver cell or a cell lining the intestines, they have a very high rate of reproduction and repair. So your gut lining is replacing itself pretty much every 72 hours. Um, your liver, if you remove over two thirds of it, as long as there's no serotic damage, um, will actually regenerate completely. And um, that's not going to be true of tissues like nerve tissue, like in the brain, where you have very, very limited uh, reproductive activity. So it's almost like nerve tissue it doesn't have a lot of life activity, but it's focused more on consciousness activities. Metabolic tissue, lots of life activity. The consciousness is more at a dimmer sort of sleep level um, and uh, so very different. So we can say that the liver has a consciousness, so does the kidneys, but they're at a different level than our normal waking consciousness. And most of their activities are uh, invested in that metabolic exchange. Um, the old alchemical name for this very active uh, turnover of matter, this sort of combustive process with breakdown, build up, and so forth, uh, they refer to this as the sulfur process. So we'll all be using that term a bit. This is very, in the language of Chinese medicine, very yang in substance. Sulfur processes, if you look at, for example, uh, a molecule like glycogen, um, that's again lots of glucose molecules stuck together. That's a storage form for glucose. Um, energy had to be put into those bonds. So you can say that glycogen stores lots of energy. So it's very young in substance. Um, it's more of a storage molecule though, so it's more yin in activity. 
And so that's, there's a little bit of a paradox there, but we can think of this heat and energy and warmth all being trapped in matter. Same thing with fatty acids. I think a lot of heat is trapped in those molecules, very young in substance, but you know, they just sort of sit there and it's storage forms and that's yin in activity. Um, so that's the kind of overall nature of the cells in the metabolic system. If you look at liver cells too, they're called hepatocytes. They're very large, they have lots of mitochondria, but they also have lots of endoplasmic reticulum. Remember, that's where, with the ribosomes, um, proteins are made. And so lots of protein synthesis and whatnot going on in those organs. Um, we can think really that there's a threefold uh, process going on in metabolism. We have more of in terms of ingestion and digestion, that involves the oral cavity, uh, the, small the stomach and the small intestine. The nutrient processing and metabolism, that's gonna be more the uh, bulk of the small intestine, liver, gallbladder, and then excretion and elimination organs, and that would be things like the large intestine, but also looking outside of the kidney and the bladder, so there's a threefold aspect there. Um, one way to think about that is that the uh, metabolic system has an upper domain. We can say this is related more to the form forces that are similar to the nervous system, and that would be in the esophagus, stomach, uh, and even the small intestine, large intestine in general, you'd say that's sort of the head of the GI system. Um, and that's broken down into a foregut, midgut, hindgut. We'll come to that in a second here. So there's a threefold division there as well. Um, in fact, the foregut, that's esophagus, stomach, proximal, duodenum, that's where food is broken down primarily. That's cat catabolic, almost like a nerve process where you're breaking things down to release the energy for other activities. And then the midgut, that's going to be small intestine, and, uh, uh, small intestine and the proximal large intestine, so that should be small intestine, not stomach. Um, this is more where we have these rhythmic contractions, we have a mixing, propulsion, absorption of these substances. Uh, and then the hindgut, that's going to be distal large intestine, rectum, that's where we have more the substance that actually comes out. Uh, in the real metabolic pole, these organs, if you look at the large intestine, they're loaded with bacteria, and that's a very metabolic in nature. Um, so that is the uh, upper pole. There is, we can think of the opposite to the, if we think of the digestive tract as sort of the head of the metabolic system, it's going to be your muscles that are at the actually opposite pole. Um, so if you look at, for example, the liver provides the glucose for your muscles, the muscles uh, use up that glucose that they do it anaerobically, they make lactic acid. That has to go back to the liver and it's recharged, it's remade into glucose. That's called the Cori cycle. And so that is an important um, sort of polarity there. And then our organs like the liver, gallbladder, spleen, and so forth kind of stand in between. So this is a little uh, academic, but if you kind of think about it, it's interesting how these polar relationships exist between the different organs. Now we talk a lot about physiology and about you know the GI tract breaking down nutrients and providing us with our energy and that makes sense. But there's also a deeper connection and that's with what we might call the soul life. And of course the soul life refers to more our inner life of our feelings, our thoughts and so forth. We in our modern culture really just instinctively associate that with the brain. But more and more research is revealing that our soul life is not just localized in the brain. In fact, if we ask what really is the brain responsible for, it's responsible for thinking, conceptualization, uh, taking in sensory data, organizing that, uh, recognizing patterns, things like that. Uh, that's part of our normal conscious mind. Um, on a more subconscious level, we have our feeling life, which interestingly, the research is beginning to real, uh, reveal that although we have an area of the brain called the limbic system, which is in the middle of the brain, involves many different organs in the brain, uh, the feeling life is most likely centered in the breathing and circulatory rhythms. Um, and in fact, the limbic system of the brain is probably the area in the brain where nerve input from the heart, the cardiovascular system, and the uh, lungs is being mapped. Um, and so there's a strong connection there with the feeling life. So in a way, the limbic system in the brain allows us to become conscious of the feelings. Uh, but the feeling actually begins in a change in your breathing, your circulatory rhythm, heart rate, that sort of thing. Um, so we can think of the feeling life as not so much connected with the brain, but more with the chest organs uh, is kind of a center of activity. 
Um, you know, there's a lot of people talk about the heart mind and the feeling mind, heart brain, feeling brain, so forth. And we usually look at the heart chakra or the heart organ system as being at the center of that. Um, finally, there's a third aspect to the soul, and that's more your drives. Um, these are usually unconscious. Why do we do certain things? We don't really know. Um, and uh, so it's kind of, we think we have free will in that way, but in many ways are our, our, these uh will impulses are kind of taking over our lives. Um, and good data is suggesting that those will impulses are actually coming from the gut. They're coming from the intestines. We now have, for example, this notion of the gut brain access, how a lot of disorders like depression, which in some ways we can think of as a willing disorder, people don't have the drive to really make a change in positive ways. And we're finding there's a strong connection with the gut in that case, that different microflora, but also uh, irregularities of gut function are tied in with that. Um, the question is which precedes which, and that's still being worked out, but there's good data suggesting the gut and the microflora, et cetera, come first, and then the brain responses come later. Um, same thing with your liver and your kidneys and these organs. And that's why in traditions like Chinese medicine, we often connect will impulses with all of those organs. And this is uh, now being confirmed by modern research. Uh, so that's more part of the unconscious mind. So again, this would be those metabolic processes. I refer to those as the sulfur processes. Again, in the old language of alchemy, the thinking processes are the salt processes and then the rhythmic mercuric processes. So that's uh, gonna be an important uh, idea that we explore as we go, this idea that the soul Life is uh, sort of not just dependent on the brain, that actually depends on all these organs, and in particular the will impulses and drives on the GI system. Now one final thing I'll say is that many people equate soul and spirit, and in traditional medicines those were actually seen as separate. The spirit is that part that allows you to actually peer into the soul, to step back and look at your reactive patterns, your drives, your feelings, and to try to find higher meaning from that perspective. So I wanna make sure that we uh, don't equate that because that's gonna be important for later, especially when looking at working with things like mental health disorders to say that you're not just a slave of your body, your intestines, your gut flora, but you have forces in you that can actually uh, override those uh, with the appropriate training and appropriate inner work. Um, all right, so that's a little bit on the soul life and the GI system. So one more uh, important correlation here I wanna make is the idea, if we look at pathology, we really find that all of pathology um, exists between two poles. One would be a pole of inflammation, inflammatory processes, hot and moist and so forth. Uh, and interesting, if we ask where is the seat of those inflammatory processes, of course, we think of the immune system. Um, and more and more we're finding that immune system is actually centered in the gut, in the gut organs. Um, so we can think of your uh, inflammatory processes really as having a locus of activity in the intestines in your metabolic system. Now we have to of course differentiate acute inflammation, which is what I'm just talking about, and that's good inflammation. Um, so in most cases, so you get a wound or an injury, the body's response to that, and again, the self-healing mechanisms in the body are known as salutogenesis. Um, so the salutogenic uh, approach to, of the body to, uh, for healing uh, injuries is usually through acute inflammation. And then once that inflammation does its work to repair the tissues, then the repair mechanisms come in um, and they rebuild them. Um, the opposite to the acute inflammatory process, which is very dissolving, it sort of destroys matter, uh, breaks it apart and brings new life activity in. Um, but then you eventually need to form that. And that really, that impulse for that really comes from more your nerve sensory system. And so these descending forces are more cold, they're more consolidating. Um, they tend to calcify and harden tissues. Um, and so this is uh, an important process, for example, in embryonic development, where you think, can think of yourself as starting like a ball of jelly, which needs to be hardened and solidified. Those are those nerve forces that come in that actually do that work. Um, same thing though in uh, normal sort of repairing after that acute inflammatory process comes in, a, a process of tissue consolidation and rebuilding repair has to be established. Um, so those are the uh, hardening forces. Now, unfortunately that process can become 
overextended. If it goes too far, there's too much hardening, uh, and if it's not properly balanced by the acute inflammation, we end up getting scarring or fibrosis. Fibrosis is laying down of extra collagen. We get tissues that become mineralized. That collagen can fill with minerals, different heavy metals and toxins and so forth. So we see that in atherosclerosis. We'll look at that in uh, detail in the cardiology block. Uh, that's the forming of plaques and arteries. Uh, deposition of minerals in the, for example, arterial sclerosis, where the little arterioles get hardened and stiffened. Uh, tumors, uh, even things like Alzheimer's, where we find misfolded proteins in the central nervous system. These would all be sclerotic, fibrotic processes. Um, so that has to be countered by that acute inflammatory process. Unfortunately, if the acute inflammation can't fully heal that, what we get is chronic inflammation. And that's really where we get inflammation plus scarring going on at the same time. So this is really the hallmark of a lot of modern disease, and we can speculate about why that's so. If we look 100 years ago, people were dying of acute inflammatory illnesses. Um, they were not dying of sclerotic hardening illnesses. Now we have just the opposite. We can argue that a lot of our medical interventions are actually suppressing acute inflammation. That would be from NSAIDs and Tylenol to corticosteroids, antibiotics, even immunization. Um, in a way, and immunization can be a very powerful tool, um, has a way of shifting the immune response more from Th1, which is acute inflammatory, to Th2, which is more involved, more of a cooler, uh, more allergic type inflammation. And um, so that also shifts you away from having good acute inflammatory responses. If you couple that with, you know, all of our life activities, which tend to foster more sedentary lifestyle, not being active metabolically, that sort of thing, then we have the sort of setup for chronic inflammation. Um, and we get things like autoimmune diseases, we get uh, you know, liver cirrhosis, we get all of our cardiovascular disease, and so forth. <clears throat> so that's the chronic inflammatory process. So seated in the metabolic system is the route to healing. In a way, that's why you know, uh, physicians like Hippocrates in the West said, you know, the, the route to healing really lays in the gut. Um, and that's partly because the gut activity, if it's properly balanced and maintained, actually can help um, prevent that sclerotic fibrotic process from accumulating in the body and other places. Now, how do we connect this to Chinese medicine a little bit more? Well, if you look at Chinese pathology, uh, well, if you look just at physiology, first of all, um, we have four basic physiologic activities uh, in the tissue. So we have what's called the yang activity, we have our yin activity, our qi activity, and our blood activity. So let's look at the first pairing here, yang and yin. Yang refers to more the warming, uh, sort of dynamic, a lot of them catabolic processes, which are breaking down matter, releasing energy. Um, if you look at that, that's really metabolism in general. So we can correlate yang in any organ, like liver yang or kidney yang, to the metabolic activity of that organ. Uh, and that is maintained largely by the actions of the mitochondria. Um, and what mitochondria need to do that properly is oxygen. So arterial blood flow, which brings the oxygen into tissues, um, you know, the every tissue is actually self-regulating how much blood flow is getting in there. And the cardiovascular system is kind of uh, allowing that to happen. And so um, the amount of oxygen that gets in really determines a lot of the mitochondrial activity, how much aerobic metabolism and so forth is going to happen there. Um, and that's uh, going to be augmented by different hormones like androgens, cortisol, even thyroid. Um, so that's all part of what we might call the yang activity, creating tissue warmth, creating metabolism and so forth. Now, when that pattern is deficient, we have a yang deficiency pattern, so lower metabolism, decreased warmth. The opposite of that would be a yang excess pattern, which would be fire or heat. And if we look at areas of inflammation and so forth, we often see increased metabolism, uh, increased oxidative stress from free radicals and so forth. So that would be more of a fire pattern. Um, stagnation would be kind of an imbalance between those two, and I'm just going to say it's really not applicable in this case. So we usually talk about the yang excess or deficiency. Um, on the other, other hand, um, that part of the tissues which provides moisture and nutrition, uh, if you look at any tissue, we have, of course, the active cells in that tissue that's called the parenchyma, and then you have connective tissue that's called the stroma around those cells. And that stroma is saturated in water. That water is often bound up like a jelly. 
to the collagen fibers and proteoglycans, and uh, that forms this very nutritive rich environment around the cells. And, um, and uh, we can even look at things like mucus and phlegm is all part of that as well. Um, even things like the microbiome, which actually grows in the outer mucus layer of the intestine. Uh, we'll look at that structure in detail here shortly. But that microbiome also provides nutrition to cells and so forth. So this would all be part of what we refer to as the yin in Chinese medicine. And so yin deficiency would be things like decreased mucus, decreased flora, we'd have increased ulceration because in the GI tract we'd have a loss of that mucus layer which is very protective, especially in the stomach to stomach acid. Uh, things like leaky gut and so forth would be maybe part of a yin deficiency. When you dry up the moisture then the heat symptoms tend to predominate. And that's why a lot of yin deficiency has what we call deficiency heat. Uh, hot flashes and night sweats and things like that. The yin excess pattern would be increased phlegm mucus. Uh, in fact, the name for that would be if it happens in the large intestine with, let's like, say, an overgrowth of microflora, we call that dysbiosis. If there's an overgrowth of the flora in the small intestine, we can call that SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Um, so we could call it large intestine, dysbiosis could be LIBO and then SIBO. Uh, we used to just refer to them both together as dysbiosis. So, but basically that's yin excess phlegm. The uh, traditional herbal physicians in the West call it canker, like this, like this film mucus that sort of coats everything and prevents proper yang metabolic forces from descending and uh, uh, taking hold of those tissues. So those would be the yang and the yin polarity. On the opposite end, we'd have the qi and the blood polarity. Qi really, um, although there's lots of different interpretations, I'm going to be focused on qi really as an aspect of the autonomic nervous system. If we ask, for example, what are qi deficiency or excess states, they usually involve the autonomic nerves. So, for example, um, if you look at the intestines, we have our vagus nerve, which innervates most of the intestines all the way down to the distal one-third of the colon. Uh, and then there are actually sacral nerves that innervate the rest of the colon with parasympathetic impulses. The vagus and the parasympathetic nervous system in general is going to stimulate peristalsis, uh, going to increase contractions, increase the flow of nutrients through the uh, intestines and then defecation and so forth. The sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight, um, has the opposite effect. It decreases peristalsis. And then different hormones assist that, like thyroid hormone actually improves peristalsis and so forth. But really the nervous system is really the key here. So if we look at uh, things like um, uh, qi deficiency, we have more of a decreased peristalsis, maybe increased bloating, bacterial overgrowth. That happens because the intestines are not flushing down all the bacteria. Uh, and so we get that, then that SIBO or that dysbiosis pattern. So that's a qi deficiency. Qi excess would be more of a constriction. That would be like overactivity of the parasympathetics. And that can happen in conditions like IBS. We get diarrhea, cramping, increased secretions, and so forth. Um, so that would be more of an excess pattern of uh, the nerves are overactive. The parasympathetic nerves are overactive. Um, so that's, uh, that's the two polarities there. Now we can think of a qi stasis pattern that's more of a lack of rhythm. Um, and that's kind of just teasing things out a little too far. For most cases, we can usually just think of that as a qi deficiency or excess, depending on the case. So think of the qi as really being carried by the nerve activity, the nerve forces. And the blood would be the nutrition in the plasma of the blood. Remember, blood is really plasma plus cells. And when we say blood in Chinese medicine, we're really referring largely to, we're really referring to both, but the plasma has a big role to play there. And that's all of your nutrients, glucose, amino acids, electrolytes, but also your hormones that all the other organs have secreted into that, which have a nutritive role. They sort of stimulate metabolism and so forth. Um, so things like insulin tells the cells to take up glucose. Uh, estrogen is very anabolic in that way as well. So it's a growth hormone. That's what GH is. Uh, so we can think of the blood as more the nutrition to the gut wall. So blood deficiency would be more of an atrophy of the gut wall because of lack of nutrition. Uh, and that happens in different hormonal states. We'll look at that. Uh, but then blood excess would be states more where there's actually hemorrhage. The blood is leaking out and so forth. We, 
can have that happen in different inflammatory states. And so there's a strong connection often with the fire aspect. Uh, and then there's a intermediate stage, we can call that blood stagnation, where we have increased risk of forming blood clots in the blood, that's called thrombosis, that's a pathological condition, or endothelial dysfunction, the cells that line the capillaries in the blood vessels, that's endothelium, um, that stops producing the right gases like nitric oxide and, and endothelin, which are all important for regulating vasodilation and vasoconstriction. And uh, so that can create a blockage, decreased circulation into a tissue. And we'll look at this pattern in much more detail in the cardiovascular block because that's uh, sort of the key to a lot of cardiovascular disease is understanding that. So these are gonna be the basic patterns we're gonna see going through the theme with all the different uh, GI organs as we explore them in more depth. Okay, let's just look a little bit at the embryology of the gut. Remember going back to a very basic discussion embryology we had last term. Um, the uh, embryologic development really happens pretty much by the week. So after fertilization, as the zygote, which is the fertilized ovum, moves down the oviduct um, towards the uterus, it starts to undergo a process of cleavage. It becomes what's called the morula, which is compacted cells. And then usually around the end of the first week after fertilization, it's gonna implant in the uterine wall. And at this point, it's called a blastocyst. Um, it has uh, what's called an inner cell mass here and then an outer mass. The inner cell mass will form the future embryo. The outer cells will form the placenta and the chorion and the surrounding structures. And that's going to implant by the end of the first week. Um, by the uh, second week, the, uh, this inside with the inner cell mass of the blastocyst will further differentiate into two groups of cells. And by the third week, we get this structure where we have the in implanted uh, blastocyst. Uh, it's now called an embryoblast. And uh, it's going to have three germ layers. It's going to have the ectodermal layer. Uh, it's going to have a middle mesoderm, shown in red here, and then a yellow endodermal layer. And there's a little structure here called the yolk sac. This was the primitive nutrition that the embryo had. That's starting to involute. It's going to be sucked up and kind of brought into the uh, endoderm. So these three layers, uh, these three primary germ layers, ectoderm, endoderm, mesoderm, are going to form all of your tissues. And these structures around that, this is going to form the placenta uh, over here uh, and the chorion and uh, so forth. Um, so if we look at where the GI organs originate from, they come almost entirely from the endoderm. Now, Organs are complicated because they usually are a mix of different embryonic tissues. So if we look at the uh, GI tract, it's really the endoderm which forms all of this, the inner lining of the intestines. Um, it also forms the uh, organs like the liver, the gallbladder, the pancreas, the tonsils. Interestingly, the endoderm also forms the inner lining, the epithelium of the lungs. So the trachea, the bronchi, and the alveoli, the air sacs. And that shows you a very interesting connection between the lungs and the GI tract. They come from the same embryonic tissue. And that's why a lot of GI disorders, often we find respiratory disorders. So GI phlegm, that phlegm condition I talked about, we see the same overproduction of phlegm and so forth often in the lungs. And so a lot of our herbs that we use to treat GI disorders actually are applicable to the lungs as well. So there's a lot of crossover there. Um, also your genital epithelium, as well as your germ cells come from the endoderm. So the cells lining the bladder and the urethra, the prostate, the uh, bubble urethral glands, the vagina, the area around the vagina, the vestibule, and the egg and sperm cells all come from endoderm. Uh, a little bit of your tympanic membrane and the auditory tube comes from endoderm. And then importantly, your thyroid, parathyroid, and thymus are your three endodermal uh, endocrine organs. And so they're gonna be connected with metabolism. So if we ask what all these organs do, they're all involved in that metabolic sulfur uh, life-giving activity. Now, importantly, the gut has, of course, an epithelium, that's the inner lining, but it's going to have smooth muscle as well, and the smooth muscle actually comes from the mesoderm. So the mesoderm gives you your muscle layer, and the gut also has nerves. Um, so in embryonic development, the ectoderm, which gives rise to the nervous system, will also send nerve projections into the gut. So the gut's complicated that it has all three. We can say its primary uh, embryonic tissue is the endodermal tissue. So let's look a little bit more at the embryology of the gastrointestinal tract. 
Um, so it really uh, it's going to start to form primarily in the third week of embryonic development after fertilization. Um, and the gut tube, which is where the GI tract will form from, really extends from what's called the bucopharyngeal membrane. And that's going to be up here in the head end of the embryo, if you look down at this picture uh, up here. Um, and then it's going to end at what's called the cloacal membrane down here. So um, basically that's going to form at the bucopharyngeal membrane, that'll be the mouth, and at the cloacal membrane that's going to be the anus. Um, and um, the, uh, again, the tract is going to receive projections from all the germ layers. So we're going to have nerves and muscle and whatnot going in there. Um, by week four, we see three distinct regions in the gut, what's called the foregut, the midgut, and the hindgut. So I talked about those before. And why these are important is that each section has its own arterial and nerve supply. So if we look at, again, the nerve sensory activity follows the nerves, the uh, sort of metabolic activity follows the arterial supply. We can think of these sections of the gut as actually separate. They have their own activity. So for example, the foregut, which the stomach is a major organ of the foregut, has a branch. This is showing the aorta coming down here. That's your main artery in the body, in the lower body. Um, the um, celiac artery is a branch in your solar plexus area, just under your uh, breastbone. Um, and uh, that's going to send projection to the stomach and the pancreas and the liver. And then we have what's called the mesenteric arteries. There's a superior mesenteric and an inferior mesenteric. And they're going to send uh, their arterial supply to different parts of the intestines. So the superior mesenteric to the midgut, the inferior mesenteric to the hindgut. Um, so those are the three distinct embryonic divisions of the GI tract. Um, each division, again, is going to have... Um, its own nervous system, and that's coming from the ectoderm. Um, now there are two, the nervous system in the gut um, is gonna have a twofold component. One is the parasympathetic sympathetic nerves. We call those the extrinsic nerves. Um, and then there are actually nerves in the gut wall, and that's called the intrinsic nervous system of the gut. It's also given the name of the enteric nervous system. So the enteric nervous system is what a lot of people are referring to as the second brain of the body, the gut's brain. Um, it actually has uh, uh, as many neurons, if not more, than the spinal cord. Um, so it has its own sort of memory, it has its own reflexes, and we're realizing more and more and more how tied in the gut nervous system is with all sorts of gut disorders. And again, if we link qi and qi activity with the gut nervous system, that makes a lot of sense. We see a lot of disturbance there in the Chinese medicine thinking. Um, now the foregut is going to give rise to the oral cavity, the pharynx, again the respiratory tract, the esophagus, the stomach, uh, duodenum, up to the bile duct opening, so the first sort of third of the duodenum, the liver, the bile system, which very importantly, and I'll just emphasize this here, includes the hepatic ducts, which are where the bile is collected in the liver. So the bile is actually made in the liver, it's collected in little ducts, it comes out, and it actually goes the duct goes into the pancreas, and we'll explore this in much more detail, uh, and then it's going to dump into the small intestine. And the gallbladder is kind of halfway along the way. There's this little extension called the cystic duct, and the gallbladder hangs off of it. So if you look at the, if here's the liver, we have these bile ducts, and they eventually collect into two, the left and right hepatic ducts. They come together, and then they go out, and they join up in the pancreas, where the pancreatic duct comes together, and that's going to dump into the small intestine, into the duodenum. The gallbladder is just a little sac called the cystic duct. It hangs off. And basically what happens is um, bile is constantly being made and secreted. So it's going to flow down this duct system. Um, if you don't have any fat in your meal or you're not eating at the time, there's a little sphincter here which closes. And so the bile will back up and then it overflows into the gallbladder. So this is gallbladder is more of a storage organ. It has nothing to do with really making bile or synthesizing it. It does tend to take water out and make it either more or less concentrated. Uh, and that can be a real problem with gallstones. Um, but when we say gallbladder in traditions like Chinese medicine, we're really referring to the whole bile making process and the bile system. And that's why if you took this organ out, you still have a bile system. Uh, in fact, the common duct actually swells a little bit and becomes like a secondary gallbladder. Um, so uh, be sure not to confuse that when we say anatomical gallbladder. That's not the same as what in Chinese medicine, for example, is referred to as gallbladder.
And the pancreas is also a derivative of the foregut. And again, the celiac artery is what supplies blood to all these organs, with the exception of the uh, the esophagus, respiratory, all these. So basically, celiac artery is going to be everything below that red line. Um, okay, so midgut um, is going to give rise to the small intestine starting at the uh, distal to the bile duct opening in the duodenum. Um, it's going to uh, go all the way down to what's called the cecum. Uh, which is the um, uh, area around the appendix and large intestine, the appendix itself, the ascending colon, and the right two-thirds of the transverse colon. Um, that is going to be the midgut, and that's supplied by the superior mesenteric artery. And the hindgut is going to be the left one-third of the transverse colon, uh, descending colon, sigmoid colon, rectum, superior anal canal, and then the urinary epithelium, and that's the inferior mesenteric artery. So again, we can think of a threefold division from embryology here in the gut. So another way of thinking about the GI system is really it's, it's our inner skin. It's the polar opposite to our outer skin. So if we think of our outer body here and our inner body, this is our outer skin, and that's where the outer world is going to contact us. Well, the GI tract too is technically the lumen is the outer world, and that's where the nutrients will then contact the inner skin. Um, and what's interesting is we're finding the GI tract is studded with sensory receptors and, and pressure receptors, one that just like your skin is. And uh, so it's responding to all these different nutrients and so forth. In fact, the very interesting phenomena is that we've discovered taste receptors all along the GI tract, including the respiratory epithelium. And that's why, again, these are all the same endodermal origin. So all endodermal tissues have these same kind of receptors. We've also found smell receptors. There are over 360 of them. Um, we've, often, we've also found those in the gut lining. So, so technically the gut is actually sensing, smelling, tasting, uh, everything that comes into it. And um, it doesn't have to be at the conscious level. It's actually doing that unconsciously. And that's where potentially herbal substances and whatnot are being smelled and tasted unconsciously. And then interestingly, the nervous system in the gut is sensing that. It's, it's conveying that information to the vagus nerve, which then carries that up to the brain. 80% of those vagal fibers are sensory. So the brain is now able to consciously make sense of that. So that's uh, interesting there. Also from the brain centers, information can go out to other organs. So just by tasting at the unconscious level, a nutrient or a molecule, plant molecule in the gut, we can have an effect via the nervous system on an organ where that substance didn't actually have to get into the blood. And that's where we can open up the doorway to understanding very low-dose phenomena with herbs and things, which do don't make sense from the traditional pharmacologic angle. Um, so it is an inner, if you look at the inner surface of the intestines, they're about 250 square meters. That's the size of a tennis court. So if we unfold it all, take out all the crinkles and the undulations, the villi and the microvilli. It's about the size, surface area of the size of a tennis court. So that's your absorptive area. Um, skin, on the other hand, is only about one to two square meters. So we have a lot more surface area in your GI tract than the skin. Um, it's not just a tube for digestion. It's actually a living, breathing, sensing membrane. So I hear people say, just a tube. It's not actually that. It has a lot more to it. Um, if we look at the foregut, here is where substances are really broken down. And we're going to see our major foodstuffs broken down into their individual monomers. Um, we can think of this as catabolic. It's very nerve sensory like. Um, we actually have a conscious tasting in the mouth and then as it goes further down it becomes unconscious, but more related to the consciousness pole. Um, we have a very strong relationship with the nervous system. Peristalsis is really guided by those nerve impulses. Uh, the pancreas is really where we have uh, the influence, we can say, of our higher aspects. So if we think of our shen, our spiritual aspect, how does the spirit grab hold of the GI tract? Well, it actually does it through the pancreas. And it does it through the sugar. Um, and it does it through the insulin of the pancreas and the glucagon, the other hormones that are needed for sugar metabolism. Um, so we'll look at the pancreas in detail, but... That is really, we can think of the outpost uh, where this uh, Shen activity can actually get a hold of the GI organs and uh, work there. Um, we'll see a lot of the conditions related, for example, type two diabetes to insulin resistance and whatnot. We can think of those as Shen disturbances on a very deep level. Uh, but anyways, that would be 
one place where those forces make contact with the GI tract. Um, the spleen, we're going to have to talk about that one separately. I'll, I'll have a little section on the spleen. Spleen in biomedicine is not technically associated with digestion. It's more like a giant lymph node for the blood. It actually stores blood. It breaks down uh, old red blood cells. It stores platelets primarily in humans. Um, but it also has an immune filtering role. And what we're realizing is the spleen is a very important place where when antigens, peptides, are leaked in from the gut, maybe if you have leaky gut or something like that, um, they circulate in the blood and it's the spleen that primarily filters them. And uh, there are immune cells in the spleen which can become really activated in the presence of certain antigens if certain conditions are met. So if we're finding if people are in a, are in a constant sympathetic overdrive, high sympathetic state, they're going to become um, intolerant. They're going to provide develop sensitivity to those antigens versus people in a parasympathetic state, paradoxically, same antigen actually now develop no reaction. They get tolerance to that. Um, so the spleen is an important immune surveillance organ, which is deciding that. And uh, so we'll look at that, but we can think of that as sort of a death process in the blood where the blood goes to die, literally the red cells go to die, but also the antigens and whatnot go to the coffin of the spleen to be gotten rid of. Um, and so this is where we can think of the chun and the shen. Those in the West, we call that the astral and the eye. They work more catabolically, all in the foregut. Um, we also have a lot of what are called enteroendocrine cells. We'll look at those which secrete hormones. And many of them are sensory cells that line the inside of the gut. And then there are sensory organs in the gut. The midgut is more associated with rhythmic contractions. This is more the, we can think of this as more the feeling part of the gut. Um, this is where absorption and simulation happen, mostly to the liver or the lymph, like we talked about. There are breathing-like rhythms. And then here we see a strong relationship with small intestine disorders like IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, in the emotional life. Um, people get stressed, they get a lot of really complex emotions, and they get diarrhea, constipation, that sort of thing. Disturbances in peristalsis. And the hindgut is more where we're going to have all that rich bacteria, really concentrates in the large intestine, very sulfur-like, uh, largest concentration of the microbiome. The microbiome does uh, actually synthesize some vitamins like vitamin B12 and K and so forth, but we can think of this as more the seat of the life activities. So each of the areas of the gut has its own function. We can think of the descending catabolic forces more predominant in the foregut, the ascending metabolic force is more predominant in the hindgut, and the midgut is kind of an uh, area in between. Okay, so that's going to be it for the sort of basic introduction here to the kind of GI system, how it fits in with the whole of the, of the human being. Uh, we're going to go next into looking at the actual structure of the gut wall in the next video, and uh, we'll look at all the different gut cells and so forth. And then in subsequent videos, we're going to look at individual GI organs in depth and, and kind of explore those.